You're listening to Behind the Wheels with Doug Mason, Dave Walters, and Mike Yeagley. This is a show where we talk about heavy truck and medium-duty axolands. Doug, Dave, and Mike bring close to 100 years of experience and expertise in the transportation business. Join us once a month to learn new things about axolands. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Wheels. I'm Mike Yeagley. And I'm Doug Mason. I'm Dave Walters. So uh, every week, uh, once a month, I should say, once a month, Dave, myself, and Doug get together and we talk about Axelens and what's happening in the industry. Today, we are very honored to have some friends from Daimler joining us. We have uh, Ryan Major, Alexander Lee, and Joseph Kidd. Ryan, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, sure can. Yeah, thanks for having us on and excited to be here and and, uh, excited about the topics we got coming up. My group, uh, we're, we're responsible for the marketing uh, in the on-highway segment, uh, mostly focused on the uh, Cascadia model for Freightliner, uh, as well as the M2 uh, for the on-highway applications. And uh, so we get, we get into a variety of uh, technologies. As you can imagine, you know, customers are uh, asking us for, for different solutions for a lot of different things. And um, uh, so, yeah. Okay, uh, Joe? Hey, uh, yeah, I'm Joe Kidd. I manage our marketing fleet for the uh, on-highway segment. So we, we have quite a few Cascadias and M2s in the fleet. Uh, a lot of them are equipped with Alcoa wheels and wheel ends. So um, yeah, yeah, excited to be on the conversation today. We love to hear that part. Uh, <laughs> Alex. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Not much to add to what Ryan and Joe said. Again, um, been with the industry, the trucking industry and Freightliner for 16 years. So uh, I've seen the changes over the years from uh, steel wheels to aluminum, and Alcoa has been a big part of that. Um, and uh, like Joe said, we we love them putting them on our trucks and uh, uh, having them uh, displayed in our on our vehicles. Oh, fantastic! Thank you, guys. So today, you know, we wanted to have you in, and I really appreciate you guys making the time to join us to talk a little bit about the tr- the trends and the technology in wheel ends. As we've said, this conversation that we have going on here is really focused on what's happening on the wheel ends. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you see, what you you know, from an OEM perspective, what is it that you guys see coming down the down tracks into the wheel end that our listeners might be interested in? Yeah, sure. Uh, Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that we're uh, looking at as a as an OEM is trying to figure out where we can improve fuel economy where possible. Um, so we've, over the last, uh, gosh, at least decade, uh, we've been working very hard at trying to squeeze out, you know, every uh, fuel economy improvement that we can. And uh, so we're, we've, uh, I would say we've whittled away at the big stuff and, and we're trying to, we're looking at, still looking at everything uh, to see where there's ways to improve and, and improve efficiency. Um, so a lot of those uh, end up leading to the wheel end. Um, as you know, tires uh, are a major contributor to fuel economy. And uh, so we're, we're looking at um, working with uh, tire suppliers and, and partners uh, to improve tire technology, um, tire monitoring, uh, and also, you know, even, even on the brake side. And, uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about it later, but uh, we have aerodynamic uh, wheel covers uh, that we're offering too. Uh, so uh, fleets are looking at um, and customers are looking at a, a number of different technologies to improve efficiency. And uh, uh, yes, uh, just hap- just so happens a lot of those are, are right in the wheel end. So Ryan, I mean, I've heard different numbers for the contribution, the percentage contribution for uh, fuel efficiency that tires uh, contribute. I've heard numbers, pretty big numbers. Do you have that off the top of your head? Yeah, I so think like it's 30% uh, or something. Yeah, that's that's generally what I've heard. I think uh, TMC had uh, had published a um, a number right around that thirty to forty percent of, of fuel usage is is required to basically turn that wheel and tire assembly. And um, so yeah, so it's a big amount. And then I think uh, obviously what what ends up happening is that you know that's at the ideal state. You know, so if if uh, the pressure and the tire starts dropping. Um, or, you know, whoever the operator or whoever's managing the truck is not keeping an eye on the pressure, that's when you're going to start to see even a more impact, you know, to your fuel economy. Right. 
So what's the, the, the tire pressure monitoring systems are really, you know, getting into getting the most out of your tires from a fuel efficiency standpoint, reducing the, the rolling resistance, I'm assuming is really what you're looking to be doing there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're, we are uh, uh, heavily recommending, uh, you know, customers look at uh, using some type of tire pressure monitoring system. Uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, one is the fuel economy aspect of it, uh, uh, just keeping an eye on that pressure and keeping it at a uh, at a consistent pace definitely helps the tires live longer and and get you that that fuel economy or maintain the fuel economy, I should say. Um, and then the other benefit I would say is on the safety side. Um, you know, as you start, if if for some reason there is you catch a nail or uh, the tire uh, happens to get cut somehow from debris. Um, the driver can see that and, and see that warning pop up um, before he gets to a state where it's, you know, completely out of pressure or, or completely flat. And then he's trying to battle, you know, getting off the road and, and um, trying to figure out what, what's going on with that tire. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the big benefits, too, is, is the safety side of it. Um, so it's not just fuel economy, but, but safety as well. I just say, just have a question. You said you try, you encourage that to, you know, to your customer. Do you find a lot of pull or is it a push from your side? What is the acceptance out in the, the industry right now? And what is the feeling for the need for tire pressure monitoring sensors amongst you know, the majority of your customers? Yeah, I would say it's growing uh, as far as interest goes. Uh, right now, uh, out of our factory, uh, we, we do have a factory installed option. Um, and that we've seen about a 10% uh, take rate on. Um, but we do have found that a number of customers are installing these systems in the aftermarket as well. And, and uh, so that I guess that's my my big point to take away for customers is that, you know, even if you don't install it with us, we still are recommending, uh, you know, you look at some kind of aftermarket solution. And uh, so there's a number of different technologies out there. Uh, but hey, Dick, I would say it's coming more to the forefront now. What are you hearing in the field uh, when it comes to tire pressure monitoring systems? I can uh, I might be able to to take that uh, if you'd like, um, uh, but I I'd say that I think that the uh, the big or the first thing customers ask us or want to look into when looking at these systems is the maintenance and the and the upkeep of them. So that's that's always the the big question, and, uh, and that's what a fleet needs to look at when they're looking at these systems is uh, because every customer has a different you know tire vendor they may be partnered with or uh, you know a maintenance company that they're working with. Um, or it may, you know, it may be sporadic. They may be running all over the country and their tires could see a different technician, you know, week to week. Um, so I think that that plays a big factor in, in uh, which system that they, they want to go with. Because that's always the big fear is that, you know, you take your truck into a shop and let's say you're having a tire replaced and the technician ignores or, or, or forgets to reinstall the tire pressure sensor. And then you've defeated the whole the whole system or the purpose of it. So that's that's always the big big question. So so one of the things that I mean, you brought up a great point. You know the maintenance component of these uh, TPMS the the tire pressure monitoring systems. Are you guys hearing anything in the field, or is anybody on the panel here hearing anything in the field where uh, we're introducing any maintenance uh, issues? One of the things I wanted to add was us and the Daimler really to kind of help with the tire maintenance program and the PPMS, we actually created a wheel that has two valve holes. So a lot of the systems can use the one valve hole for the TPMS monitoring and the other one with the actual air gauge. So, I mean, we had a mutual big customer and they requested that. And I really got to thank Daimler for saying, hey, I see a need for that. And, and they put that in their data book. And, and it, it's been a really great program. The fleet that runs it just says it's it's lovely to be able to use different options. So as we get into this discussion about TPMS, both of us has actually seen the need of it and the customer's need and actually did that. And that really requires less maintenance instead of having that big sensor on top of a valve stem to create its own hole has been a really a great thing in the field. I've seen quite a few different systems out there. Um, now, you know, of course, I've seen the uh, the valve mounted systems that where it sits in the valve in the tire chamber. 
uh, we've seen going back years. I think the first TPMS system I saw was on a Corvette years and years ago uh, that was uh, band mounted in the drop wall. And you'll see that occasionally even today. And then, of course, like Dave mentioned, the third system that's somewhat popular out there is the uh, the, the stem mounted one where they, they have the it just attaches. It just goes right onto the, the valve stem. Are there any other ones that I'm not thinking of, Ryan, that you've seen or Doug, anybody that uh, systems that I'm not remembering at the moment? And they have some that are starting to come out that they're actually a part of the tire. I don't know, Ryan, if you've you've seen that or not. That's mm-hmm. a system that's starting to, um, I don't know how prevalent it is in the field, but I've seen uh, literature and, and work on that. Um, and there's some, another, there's two, I think, systems like that. Uh, one in Europe and maybe both of them are here now. I'm not sure. That would be the other one that I've seen. That's what I was just exactly going to mention. Yeah, there's... Um... Uh, the one we use from our factory is uh, we partnered with uh, Bendix on it, and it uses a clamp band uh, that goes inside the wheel. Uh, so the advantage is, you know, you don't have a sensor on the outside, but, you know, some customers don't like that because they want to be able to, you know, see the sensor, check it out, you know, if they if they prefer to do it that way. So, yeah, it just all depends on, you know, what the customer prefers, I guess. Like Dave mentioned, uh, we do have the dual valve system that's out there. I don't know how prevalent that is. I know we get a, a few orders here and there, but again, thanks to Daimler for helping to promote that. That is something I have heard about for many years uh, where customers were were looking for that. They were looking for that second valve hole to help uh, with the TPMS management for the air pressure management. I'm so glad that we have a partner, an, o- an OEM partner, who's willing to work with us on that. Well, hey, I got another quick question that goes along this line, Ryan. Obviously, when you get into the, the trailers and you have active systems, there doesn't seem to be the same need for the tire pressure monitoring setup. Do you see that uh, eventually getting into the drives as well, uh, that type of a system? Oh, that's a great great question. Yeah, we, we've been looking at those technologies over the years. It's uh, it, The difficulty is trying to figure out the the pathway to the wheel in on, on the drive axles. And that's always been the, the challenge. Um, yeah, def- on the trailer axles is definitely easy. Uh, Meritor has, and, and a couple other uh, companies out there have systems that easily basically use the trailer axle itself as a pathway for air. Um, but it's, it's definitely more difficult on the drive axle, you know, whether you go inside the axle itself or on the outside. Um, but we have not, you know, we, I would say there's nothing close to market um, that, you know, we would have offered from the factory, but that is something we, we continue to look at. We've been talking a lot about, about tire pressure monitoring systems. And, and honestly, the, one of the great things, of course, safety, but the, the day in, day out, when we talk to the fleets, of course, they're interested in safety, but they're also interested in saving some money. I'm looking at these other technologies that are happening in the wheel end that also are similar, where they deliver they deliver meaningful financial results for the customer, like WideBase, for example. What do you see happening in WideBase, Ryan? Uh, I would say it it's a market we thought was going to keep growing there uh, for, for a long time. But uh, honestly, uh, a lot of the tire manufacturers uh, really started putting a lot of uh, research and development into their, uh, their dual tires. And so uh, in, in terms of rolling resistance, uh, they've I've really made a lot of progress with uh, dual tires. Uh, so, uh, and I know that wide base will probably still beat out a, a dual tire in most cases. Um, but the, I would say the dual tire technology is definitely caught up, you know, with with wide base as far as fuel economy goes, or uh, rolling resistance. Uh, but uh, wide base still re- uh, remains a, a great and easy solution for weight sensitive customers. Uh, and that's who we've seen really keep keep and maintain uh, using uh, wide-based tires. We're seeing the same thing. Dave, do you see anything happening in the field with wide-based? Right now, the tire costs are going up. You know, the price of rubber is going up, and really the fleets know what kind of fuel economy they get. And because of the cost of the tire, a lot of fleets have been shifting back to duels. And, you know, unless you're really in a where you can gain the weight savings is such a big savings. You know, one time a lot was running wide base for fuel economy, but I see a trend that they're really shifting back off of that. But the weight advantage is still there and alive and well, but 
you know, the cost of the tires is something that they antiquate in their data. And so a lot of them are shifting back to duels now. I'm always amazed at how sophisticated our customers are when it comes to the way these different technologies play out, both from a safety perspective and also from a financial perspective, just how detailed their studies are. It's amazing how just a little modification to the technology will flip them one way or another. Six by two uh, is another thing that's coming. How do you see that playing out with, uh, with wide base and tires in general, Ryan? Yeah, I think I think about the same uh, as what we previously mentioned. I think it'll be definitely keep, uh, you know, keep on being used by weight sensitive customers. Um, but as we, uh, you know, start to see more six by two technology out in the market, um, it's possible down the road uh, we might see some customers, you know, look at that, you know, wide based uh, technology again. Um, you know, like I said, the tire technology, it's its amazing, you know, still to this day, uh, they're able to keep improving uh, designs and, and coming out with uh, better tires uh, every year. It's uh, it really blows me away from a, a techie side of things. And uh, so I, I, we see that continuing to happen, um, especially as, like I mentioned uh, earlier, we're, we're really every company is looking at ways to to gain efficiency and and tires continue to be a, a one pathway for us. We talk a little bit about tire balancing, for example. You know, historically here in North America, we haven't seen a whole lot of I'm familiar with getting tire balancing. That's we get a little bit more push for tire balancing in Europe uh, or in uh, in Asia where they have the cab over designs. Not so much here in North America. Dave or Doug, or does anybody on the panel here have any comments on tire balancing? Anything that you're seeing? Tire balancing, when I first got in the industry, was quite prevalent. Now, again, we were back in the biased tire days. But as the tires, uh, you know, as, as they had closer to zero and as closer, you know, like an aluminum wheel that is close to zero as you can get. As we become closer and closer to zero, it is really because we're so much more efficient at making our products closer to zero balance that you really don't see a need at the fleet level that you once did. Some of them still balance the steer tires, but boy, most of them has gone away from the drives. And, uh, you know, that's really became a non-issue where at one time it used to be. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I, I've been saying also. Doug, did you say that there was a study once? I thought you and I were having a discussion about the fuel efficiency benefits of tire balancing. There's, there's been a study, and it's been published by TMC, I don't know, um, probably about maybe five, Dave, you know, five or six years ago, where if on a complete uh, tractor trailer unit you were to fully balance and keep your tire wheel assembly balanced, that you could achieve a little over a 2% fuel savings, which would seem quite significant. Um, one thing I don't know for sure about that study, if it was done with uh, a steel wheel or an aluminum wheel setup. So from the baseline to the fully balanced, what the differential was. You know, like Dave is saying, the closer you can get to fully balanced, the uh, more efficiencies you're going to gain and the better fuel mileage ultimately you're going to achieve. So it's really your, your base starting point is going to give you the amount you're going to save. I mentioned earlier, I, we don't see a whole lot of big push for balancing here in North America. It is something certainly that we, from a wheel end perspective, we're always talking about it. But at least here in North America, I'm not seeing the big push. Just, I'll just add maybe on, on the balancing as well. And Dave, I think you can weigh in on this. Uh, balance weights uh, have a tendency to come off. Or if you, you balanced at one point and then the, you get a, any type of tire movement or rotation, and as the tire wears, you're going to get a different pattern. And is the balance going to stay the same? So there's a lot of questions along those lines uh, as to you know the long-term benefit of balancing, at least in, in my mind. The clip-on style balance weights really, you know, again, some states have outlawed lead weights, so that's an issue. Um, the clip-on balance weight, technically, because radials have such a big flex in the sidewalls, get them properly seated, you almost have to deflate the air by half and beat them on and air back up, and there's more maintenance, so they really don't like those anymore. The great thing about what I've learned in my years of being with the fleets is 
If they can get a tire wheel assembly that's less than 10 ounces, it's good to go. And they don't see a big advantage of doing another step in the process. So I guess as you make your products more and more efficient, it really cuts a maintenance step out for them. When we talk about things that are changing in the, in the axle end, the type of stuff that we're seeing, another big area that we're seeing things changing is disc brakes, that move to disc brakes. Uh, it's something that we talk a lot about, uh, at least that you know, we participate in SAE, we participate in TMC, and in almost all of those forums, we are hearing about disc brakes. Ryan, what, what do you see with disc brakes? Oh, man, I... Uh... I tell you what, I am super excited about disc brakes. That's one product I've been passionate about, and and it's super excited to see the the customer take rates going up on this. It's uh, you know, it's technology that's been around for for a long time, uh, and it's definitely you know improved over ever since they were first introduced uh, years ago. But um, uh, we're we're really starting to see a movement uh, and, and more usage of disc brakes. Um, I was just checking some numbers the other day and. Just about uh, almost half of all of our uh, Cascadias are built with disc brakes uh, now, which is, in my opinion, awesome. That's it's definitely keeps moving uh, upwards. And and at initially, what we saw was, you know, when customers started uh, specking disc brakes, was they wanted it because of the safety and the stopping distance uh, aspect of it. And now what we're seeing is is more of a trend of you know, uh, fleets are coming back to look at it as a way to simplify their maintenance. Um, the, you know, just the overall maintenance of a, a disc setup versus a drum is is much more simple. And, you know, if fleets are, have been having trouble with brake violations uh, during inspections, um, I think that's also uh, where we're starting to see more interest in, in disc brake technology too, because, you know, fleets are, are trying to watch watch their scores and, and make sure that they're not getting dinged for for a lot of that stuff. And uh, so that's definitely helped driving uh, more interest in, in disc. We've had a lot of discussions on the podcast about the CVSA, about inspections, about the, the way that whole process works. It's really eye-opening when you start looking at it and the importance of keeping yourself off the radar of those inspectors, you know, and disc brakes, if, that, if that's going to be one less thing you have to worry about, that certainly has value. There's a lot of value uh, to keep yourself, uh, keep the vehicle safe. The stopping distances, of course, are, are greatly improved. But, you know, like you mentioned, you know, the, the, the importance of staying, staying off, you know, the quick, quickly managing that uh, through the CVSA is, is fantastic. Alex, you got uh, anything going on over there? Any, any comments? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. If I could just add one thing, we definitely see that the take rate and the acceptance more on the Class 8, especially the heavy duty on highway side with the Cascadia. But even more so now, um, there's a lot more discussions on the medium duty side, even down to Class 6. And again, it goes back to what Ryan mentioned earlier, not so much about the stopping distances um, and the safety as well, of course, but um, on the maintenance side, even some of the major fleets um, that not only run highway tractors, but also has a uh, P&D type application with a M2 box truck, they're also starting to migrate uh, a few into the disc brake uh, side as well. So we're starting to see that in the class six, seven medium duty market as well. I have to say, I'm, I'm sort of surprised that you're seeing that in class six, seven. That's uh, at least my impression of those, of the class six, seven market was that they tend to be fleets that are, um, well, they tend to be a, an afterthought. The, the, at least that's my impression. And maybe maybe I'm wrong, but the, the class eight is typically where all the attention is in the industry. When I go to an industry meeting, there's a lot of attention on what's happening in the class eight world. And the, the smaller, the class six, class seven, um, I'm surprised that they're getting to that level now. It's definitely a smaller portion of the population, but uh, for the maintenance reasons, the safety reasons, it's starting to trickle down into the lower the, the lower weights. It's great, great to hear. Uh, what are the options yeah. you see with uh, with disc brakes? What's the different variables that customers should be looking at? Yeah, one, uh, uh, you got me thinking about it. We were talking about medium duty um, uh, in the class six and seven market is we, we do offer hydraulic disc brakes and and I, and I probably that's what I would attribute some of the interest in the class six and seven market is that 
a lot of those customers and uh, may have their own, you know, heavy duty truck, the Chevy, Ford, you know, Dodge, and obviously who have been using disc brakes forever. So the the question is, oh, why why can't I just get disc brakes on my my larger truck? Um, and then the the other avenue is, um, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Oh yeah, other other types of disc brakes. So so when those customers are graduating, you know, class six and seven trucks, it's it's an easy crossover. And then we do offer uh, uh, air disc brakes. Uh, and that's mainly what's used on or all all that we really use on the class eight side of things. And uh, so we offer uh, three of the different vendors out there. We offer uh, Meritor, uh, Bendix, and Wabco disc brakes. So. So it can be overwhelming sometimes for a customer if they're first looking at it. When we tell a customer, hey, you've got, yeah, well, you can have disc brakes, and, but you've got three options. Which one do you want? And uh, so what I always recommend is, you know, have that customer go research uh, and talk to those, those vendors, you know, those representatives from those vendors and find out what would be a better fit for them. And uh, I think one of the neat, uh, I, I don't know if I would call it an option, but basically a feature of these, these disc brakes is, um, is that they're very easy to inspect. And a lot of times there's different components of them can be used to inspect the amount of pad width left or the amount of the rotor left. And so that makes it very quick and easy without having to have uh, special tools. Right. So let's finish off our discussion about what's happening with the axle and just touching on the, the arrow wheel covers. You know, I remember when the deflector came out which I think was the first aero wheel cover about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And I'll, I'll be frank, just my perspective on it back in those days was that I was not expecting it to really be able to deliver much of a savings. But I was proven wrong, and I don't mind being proven wrong, especially when it comes to value-add technology. What are you seeing today for aero technologies? Uh, we continue to see a lot of interest in, in uh, wheel covers. Um, we have found in our own testing that it it does play a, a key part in it. And uh, yeah, I've been excited uh, at the take rates and, and the continued usage by our customers. There's There's been a lot of good uh, feedback that we've gotten on on the covers that we're using. Uh, so today we're, we're partnered with uh, Flow Below, um, who makes a, uh, a composite uh, wheel cover. Um, and it's very easy to pull off. Um, so the, you know, as far as maintenance goes, it's very easy to, to remove and, and take a look at things. And, uh, um, but it also, you know, has an aesthetic appeal to it. You know, it looks nice. It looks clean. Uh, you can get those in different colors. You can get them in chrome or, you know, brush nickel, whatever, whatever you prefer. Uh, but yeah, we're finding that that's a big, a uh, big piece to this aero uh, puzzle um, that we've been trying to put together over the years. And uh, so we we continue to recommend it and find that um, uh, the technology is working and in the field, it's um, it's been doing well too. Uh, we've gotten requests from customers to put uh, locks on them now because uh, there was always a fear of, hey, somebody's going to walk off with my cover or a technician's going to forget to put it on or something like that. And uh, so we've actually introduced a simple lock mechanism uh, just this year to the flow below uh, covers uh, to make it easy. So the flow below uh, axle end, or what's called the flow below cover, actually is part of a full system, isn't it? It's it's more than just the wheel cover, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah, great point. Yeah, the um, so we've we've uh, done a lot of wind tunnel testing uh, to make sure that our chassis fairings end up sending that air down the chassis uh, in the right way and to make sure that these the wheel covers you know reflect that air in, the way we want it to go um, and we also oh gosh i think it's been it's been at least five years now we we introduced uh drive wheel fairings uh, so actually uh, fairings that would go you know one in between a tandem set if it was a six by four and then a rear fairing, if it, um, you know, right at the end, they're connected to the mud flat bracket. And uh, so we've been trying to basically get that flow, uh, airflow to happen naturally, you know, around the trailer. Uh, so even if you don't have trailer, uh, you know, chassis skirts on your trailer, you're still getting a decent, you know, airflow coming off the tractor. Uh, we still recommend tra trailer uh, chassis skirts. You know, if you happen to have a, a trailer that doesn't have it, you know, it's still not, not as bad as a hit if you have the drive wheel fairings. Just out of curiosity, what other um, aerodynamic devices for the tractor have been put in place or do you see coming down the line? I know there, there's gap closure things and there's other 
uh, little fins that people have been looking at. Is, are any of those coming down the line, in your opinion? Yeah, we, um, uh, let's see, just at the end of 2019, we introduced, like, basically our next round of aerodynamic improvements. And part of that was a, a newer, lower ground clearance uh, bumper. Uh, so it's a flexible uh, bumper, so it, it can take a, quite a bit of da- uh, damage before it, before it uh, you know, gets its final separation. Yeah. So it can take some abuse. Uh, we've also, at that same time, we introduced uh, deflectors uh, right at the A-pillars. Uh, yeah. So you'll actually see uh, fins right there on the either side of the windshield. Uh, we also introduced uh, longer side extenders. Uh, so our big seller was 20-inch side extenders. Uh, we've now increased that to, to 24 inch, trying to close that gap more. Right. Um, and at that same time, uh, we also introduced a, uh, a a more extended roof spoiler too. Uh, so if you take a look at some of the roof spoilers on those, you'll see it it goes quite a bit further. Uh, we also went as far as to move our uh, condenser for our parked uh, HVAC system uh, off. We moved it to the driver side in hopes that we could uh, move the trailer closer uh, to the back of the tractor and not have trailer swing issues. Uh, so I guess I, that's a good example of how far you know we've gone to, to try to improve uh, that trailer gap. What would you, just uh, out of just a rough estimate, the tractor now that you, in 2019 that you've put out or 2020, what type of uh, efficiencies do you think you have gained in the last three, five years? Uh, three five years, I would say we we will usually average about five percent. Okay. Um, so our our goal as a company is to improve our fuel economy, you know, by five percent at least every couple of years. Okay. Um, so so it actually could be more in some cases, um, depending on you know obviously what you're coming out of. But but uh, yeah, I would say in that that five percent range is is typically where we're going to be at and. And I think that's the big question a lot of customers ask us is, you know, is it worth it for me to to get a new truck at this point? And and um, so if they are running older trucks, it, it most likely would, you know, right. even with lower diesel prices right now, um, it still still probably will make business sense in most cases to uh, to upgrade to a new truck. Very good. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. I think that about covers everything that we had on our agenda. Hey, I want to once again thank our everybody from from Daimler who who participated in this. Uh, Ryan, Joe, and Alex really enjoyed having you on the show. I want to say thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Uh, we of course welcome your your comments and questions. Uh, you can you can reach us at alcoawheels.com slash podcast. There's a hick right there if you have any comments or questions. So we really would love to hear from you. I think that wraps it up. So for myself uh, and the rest of the team here at Alcoa Wheels, thanks for listening. See you next time. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation, manufacturing, and technology. Inventing the first forged aluminum wheel in 1948, its team of experts continue to develop the most lightweight, efficient, and high-performing commercial vehicle aluminum wheel products, bringing you revolutionary innovations like Alcoa Durabright wheels, Alcoa Durablack wheels, the new Alcoa wheels hubboard technology, and the lightest truck wheel on the market, Alcoa Ultra One 22.5 by 8.25 wheel. Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation.